As most of my subscribers are no doubt aware, I am a Star Trek fan. One of Star Trek's most popular authors is Peter David. Let me emphasize these are authors I'm talking about, not screenwriters. One finds their work in print, not on the screen. In Star Trek The Next Generation, two of the main characters are Commander Riker and Counselor Troy, who apparently had a romance before TNG's pilot episode. In one of the novels for which Peter David is famous, called Imzadi, he delves into this tumultuous romance. Now just to explain, Counselor Troy is half Betazoid, meaning that her home planet is Beta Z, and Imzadi is a Betazoid word which doesn't translate precisely. Apparently, Imzadi is a sort of pet name one applies to the first person with whom one reaches a certain level of intimacy that entails a telepathic component. The first person with whom this level of intimacy is both physical and mental. It has to do with Riker being assigned to Beta Z as a lieutenant, where one of his first official duties entails attending a Betazoid wedding. I have a number of subscribers whom I know are fans enough themselves to begin deriving a little amusement at the idea already. You see, at Betazoid weddings, it's the custom for the bride, the groom, and all the assembled company to be nude. Apparently, Riker doesn't know about this in advance, and so is caught a little off guard when suddenly everyone around him starts stripping down. But, not one for modesty, and not shy, as soon as this custom is explained to him, he decides to join in. He steps out of the room long enough to find a place to store his uniform, then returns to his seat, and a Betazoid woman on her way past pauses to contemplate him and says, You human men are certainly hairy. Why is that? Without missing a beat, Riker says, Traction. That's what Peter David's writing is like. Well, apparently after a few years, Peter David got tired of playing in the sandboxes of existing Star Trek series, and decided to start one of his own. This is a series found in the novels only. It's called Star Trek New Frontier. Its events revolve around the starship Excalibur, and the number of characters Peter David created himself, but also a number found elsewhere in Star Trek, though mainly as secondary characters, who have only appeared once or twice, whom evidently Peter David found interesting enough to bring in and make main characters. This includes Commander Elizabeth Shelby and Dr. Salar. The Excalibur is assigned to patrol Sector 221G, the territory of the late Thelonian Empire, the collapse of which has left a power vacuum. Their mission is basically just to prevent any given conflicts from becoming violent and possibly escalating into all-out war. Somehow, Starfleet thought one ship would be enough for that. The captain is a fellow named Mackenzie Calhoun, whose actual name I'm not sure how to pronounce, but this is its spelling. He is from a planet called Xenex, whose population he previously organized in a successful revolution against another race that had occupied the planet. In negotiating the final truce with his after their withdrawal, they appealed to the Federation to arbitrate, and that's how Mackenzie met Picard. After the arbitration is complete, Picard asks Mackenzie what's next for him, and when he doesn't know, Picard recommends service in Starfleet. His first day at the academy, an upperclassman tries to have a little fun at his expense and makes the mistake of starting in on his father. He then regains consciousness three hours later in the medical bay with a broken jaw, and Mackenzie earns himself the nickname One Punch Calhoun, which follows him all the way to graduation. Calhoun turns out to be a bit of a cowboy. He's very reminiscent of Jim Kirk. The author here seems to be very good at finding at least one opportunity in every book for him to lay someone out with one punch. In one book it takes two, and then Calhoun complains about getting old. Yes, he is very reminiscent of Kirk, yet monogamous. In book after book he only has eyes for Shelby. Only three times has the notion surfaced of him being intimate with anyone else. One of these times was before he met her. Another was when he had been out of contact with her for months, and she thought he was dead. And the third seems to have been in a book in the series I have yet to come across. Calhoun is the only Xenexian to have ever served in Starfleet. And apparently, since this makes him something of an outsider, he prefers to compose his entire crew of outsiders. That is, of people who are a little out of the ordinary, and subsequently don't normally fit in anywhere except together. One good example is the Chief of Security, a fellow named Zach Kebrin, who is the only Bricard to have served in Starfleet. Kebrin is a towering hulk of a figure, who has a knack for being mistaken for a rock formation if he stands the right way. It's funny, because over and over, Kebrin is introduced into the story from someone else's perspective. Shelby came around the corner and bumped into a mountain range. She looked up. And up. Apparently, in Starfleet Academy, Kebrin was roommates with Worf, who introduced him to the hard-boiled detective novel. Worf hated it, just because by his assessment, the detective's approach, as well as the approach of each person he dealt with, wasn't warrior-like enough. 
but apparently Kevin loved it. And one reason was that in his words, quote, the detective always had all the subtlety of a hurricane in a feather factory. Another outsider in the crew is Soletta, who was apparently conceived in an act of non-consensual sexual contact between a Vulcan mother and a Romulan father. She basically has to make her way through every book with this grim specter hanging over everything she does, grappling with her own highly conflicted heritage the whole way. There's also Dr. Salar, whom we met in an episode of TNG. She is characterized by an aversion to intimacy which is high by even Vulcan standards, and apparently this is because she was married once, and she and her husband in the act of mating also bonded telepathically, both being Vulcan of course, and while they were like that, the husband had a heart attack. She realized it and started trying to disentangle herself so she could do something about it, but apparently this takes a moment, and by the time she was done, he was gone. As a Vulcan, Salar tries to be detached, but as a doctor, she blames herself, since after all, if she could have come out of the meld a little faster, she probably could have saved him. But the reason I'm bringing all this up is the approach Peter David takes to the difficulty of gender-neutral pronouns with one particular character, the chief engineer and later first officer, a hermit named Burgoyne 172. As I recall, it was a fourth season episode of TNG, which introduced us to a race with no gender, in which every single person is neither male nor female. The Hermets, on the other hand, are both. Every single one of them has both male and female organs, internally as well as externally. It was funny because for a while it appeared that the Doctor, Salar, was pregnant by Burgoyne, while Burgoyne was pregnant by the Helmsman, a human named McHenry. That was how it seemed. It turned out not to be so, but that was how it appeared. The Hermats, being both male and female, encounter pronoun difficulties whenever they make contact with another race, because usually that race has two distinctly different genders, and sometimes more. So one of the most urgent orders of business when this happens is for a team of Hermat linguists to sit down with a team of linguists from the other race and hash out, in all that race's most common languages, a group of non-gender specific pronouns. In English, instead of he or she, it's she-he. Instead of him or her, it's here. Instead of himself or herself, it's herself. Clever, I think, but awkward. Peter David, while a very skilled author, is not much of a linguist. How come we, in the English-speaking world, can't just rid ourselves of this manner of difficulty in establishing gender-neutral pronouns? How hard can it be for someone with the right expertise? It's fair, unless speaking of a particular person, to say he or she, him or her, etc. It is fair, but incredibly monotonous. This is one sort of pronoun trouble we, we ran into here. This is not going to seem immediately related to this, but bear with me. I find the company of transgendered people uncomfortable. It's not fair, and I recognize that, and I offer my apologies for whatever they are worth. But I think, in my case anyway, most of the discomfort stems from pronoun difficulty. Clarity, utility, and accuracy are very important to me. I don't like language that is vague or ambiguous, because although it can be quite emotional, it doesn't actually provide anything for reason to work with and scrutinize. A preference for it when clear language is available is dishonest. A common objection I have to political discourse is that all too often the person in question talks of a storm without actually saying anything. I don't like discourse that describes two distinctly different groups of people, or two distinctly different acts, as if they are the same. Clear, useful, meaningful, accurate language strikes me as honest, and so I have an aversion to situations in which such is not an option. That's the other sort of trouble we run into here. But it doesn't make sense to me for something like this to remain such a consistent problem, given the fact that any given language is always undergoing change. Why can't we just develop gender-neutral pronouns? Why can't we come up with one word that means either he or she, either him or her, etc.? Why can't we just bring a team of linguists together to figure this out? First and second person pronouns, as well as plural, are not gender-specific, at least not in English. Why do third person singular pronouns have to be? 